Hello, I'm Ken Frank, and I'm here with Caitlin Torfi Kanaki, and we're going to present AI in the social context of education. We'll meet you in the middle for the AAAI symposium. We're very appreciative of the organizers of the symposium, and we're happy to be returning. We were here last year as well. This is a title and an abstract of our talk, uh, just so you can uh, have the full text if you like. And to start things off, we're going to present to you sort of a very simplified educational production function so we can understand where AI might enter in. So we might start with a curriculum uh, and then in, we have classroom interaction based on that curriculum. Uh, and then that creates student learning, which can be assessed and that can feed back into the teacher and change the classroom interaction. Of course, the assessment could also inform the curriculum, but that would be a longer term process typically. So we have a little loop here. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there are much more complicated aspects of the educational process, but this can get us started. Within that process, we can now focus on the curriculum and how AI might affect the curriculum or enter into the curriculum right there. And we have several examples uh, upcoming in the conference where the AI is used to shape or have input into the curriculum. Uh, one is helping students learn to program with automated data driven support and God I an efficient and practical AI based system designing for improving the course quality of K-12 online one to one classes. Um, and uh, that's on March 22nd and March 23rd. And for each of these processes as I go forward, I will note the relevant uh, upcoming talks as part of the conference. I won't read them all off the way I did just there. It takes too much time, but I hope you'll take a look at them. There's lots of good stuff upcoming. When we think about the uh, intelligent tutor of AI, that might come in here and interact directly with the student. And there's lots of work on the intelligent tutor this year a lot of it on March 23rd. There was a lot last year when we were here, and there's a lot in the literature. In fact, this is one of the place where, places where AI has been very successful um, in entering into the school system and potentially successful in helping kids learn. Uh, it's a great aspect of AI that it can kind of figure out the kid, react to the kid back and forth, um, and adapt to the kid. Um, and so, this is a terrific example of AI in education. AI can also be used for assessment, directly assessing what the kid knows uh, with some pre-prepared questions or otherwise, uh, and then giving that information back to the teacher to help the teacher change educational practices. And there are some examples here of how AI is being used for assessment. Of course, AI may work with the human, with humans, Kind of partners. And so one example is that intelligent tutor could in fact be sort of a assistant or coach to the teacher, um, giving information to the teacher about mm, the way the kid is thinking or suggesting to the teacher, you might say this or, or make sure you attend to that kid. And there's some nice examples of that upcoming in both March 22nd and March 23rd. I also want to call attention to the fact that uh, I have a paper about how the teacher is really the keystone species in the ecosystem of the school. And as such, the teacher has a lot to do with the way innovations are implemented into the school to the point of being able to screen out certain in innovations if they don't work with the teacher. So this way of AI being an assistant to the teacher uh, could obviously has its clear benefits just in terms of the interaction between the two, but also might help the AI be more effective in being implemented in the school, given the importance of the teacher uh, for the education production function. You can check that paper out down here, it's hyperlinked. AI can also uh, interact with the people doing assessment. I have a picture here of my colleague, Jay Thomas, uh, who works at ACT, and uh, on this project with him, we've been trying to come up with assessments of the carbon time curriculum. It's a science curriculum. And as we've done it, we've been using AI because we wanted to have open-ended responses of the students and to code literally in the millions 
of those responses is too much for humans. So we did the natural thing. We had humans label, experts label the uh, a set of data and we tried to train the AI on it um, and then test the AI. And in fact, the AI was underperforming, not doing too well at first. And then we looked back and it turned out it was struggling when the test item itself was ambiguous. So we changed the test item. Uh, that actually had the effect of improving the, the reliability among the human raters, which in turn uh, improved the reliability, the performance of the AI. So this I've shown here is uh, the AI interacting with the students and with the AI with, and with the uh, human assessment people. There's some papers here and one should be under review real soon on that. I want to now call attention to the fact uh, some of the way educators, sociologists, learning theory people think about education, which is learning is embedded in a social context. These students here have other students who are friends um, and they might learn from those students. They might be motivated by those students. The students might serve as role models. So we've broken, we've shown here the student aspect of engagement and we've embedded the student in a network. And that's very important to think about in terms of the student learning. Uh, how does that network affect the student, especially um, as they work their way up through the educational uh, tra trajectory? There is a new AI Institute at the University of Colorado uh, that is um, focusing on these student networks, student groups, and the AI partnership uh, in that team. Uh, and so I'm sure lots of great stuff will be coming forth from that AI Institute, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And there are papers at this conference that are directly or indirectly uh, helping us think about how, uh, these, how, how learning is situated uh, in, in a network and how AI could be applied to that. Uh, so I've marked them here. Um, an interesting one is the robot for education. Uh, so that would um, let the student be telepresent via a robot uh, when the student can't be physically present, maybe a great application for COVID. Along the way, we should be thinking about equity. Um, well, and we can just ask the basic question, will AI reinforce or counter existing biases? So for each of the um, components that I mentioned above, the independent AI for the curriculum, the intelligent tutor and assessment, or with humans in the loop, the coaching assistant, and the assessment with the test developer. Um, we can ask, is the AI going to reinforce the biases? So one clear place we might think about this is in terms of assessment. If the humans um, co labeling the responses in the assessment, if the humans themselves have biases, and then we do supervised learning, the AI will reproduce those biases, my guess is that concept is familiar to a lot of you, but we can ask uh, the same question throughout in the production of the curriculum. Uh, are there biases there? Is it culturally representative? Um, in the, um, uh, for the intelligent tutor, how does it interact in terms of language, et cetera? Um, so we should be asking that question throughout and there is an important talk upcoming on that that concerns the equity of AI. The next push uh, we'll put out there is um, the social context of schooling and the teacher network. So the teacher is herself embedded in a network and that can affect the teacher's motivations, the teacher's instructional practices. So we want to think about that a little bit. To my knowledge, there isn't a lot done there on teacher networks, but uh, for the organizational theorists, the sociologists of education, this isn't a very important area. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of what we do without AI with the idea that it will help you consider what could be done with AI. So when we get network data on teachers, which is one way we think about the, the social context of the teacher, we can ask a teacher, uh, say Lisa Jones, please indicate who helped you with technology at your school and the frequency with which you interact with each person. Well, Lisa Jones lists Bob Jones, there's Lisa Jones one, she lists Bob Jones person two with a frequency of two. And we can enter that into our data. It's called an edge list, a one, two, two. And Lisa Jones also lists Sue Meyer at a level of four. So we enter that as a one, three, four. These can, this is an edge list or can be considered uh, elements of a matrix. Row one, column two, that cell has a value of two. Row one, column three, that cell has a value of four. 
and my colleague, Jillian Tang, who's uh, hosting this conference in part, um, has a new book out about um, the, the, the deep graph theory and, and AI. So this is how we turn survey data into that graph, which then we could apply AI to. Um, and uh, here, what we wanna do is measure some behavior of the teacher that might be related to her network. And then I'm gonna put these two things together. So we could ask teachers in survey who help them use computers. Um, and we ask, we don't just say, I'm sorry, we ask teachers how much they use computers to help them. And we don't just say how much do you use computers or how much do you use any innovation. We ask how much do you use computers to do the main things of your teaching? Introduce the new curriculum, guide student communication, model an idea or activity. These are survey responses and then we can create a mean response to this. And I'm going to show you now how we can put the network together with a survey uh, measure of, of implementation of technology. And I hope it'll conjure some ideas about what you can do with the AI. So with the, uh, the first, that edge list, who talks to whom, uh, person one nominating person two, we can create a network visualization. Each dot here represents a teacher. Lines indicate who teachers listed as close colleagues in their network. Um, and the thicker the line, the more frequently they interact. The coloring was done by my, my uh, community detection algorithm or clustering algorithm. It maximizes the ties within the groups and tries to minimize the ties between the groups. Um, and uh, what we see here is five groups and the shapes here represent grade level, grade two teachers here, grade three teachers here, multi-grade over here. And this is a little bit of code in R for, for running this sort of thing. Um, and now we can take the same uh, social space, if you will, defined here, and we can study the diffusion of innovation relative to that space. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so what we have here is that each circle, the size of the circle now represents the extent of implementation of computers in the classroom at time one, that's in one year, uh, baseline year. And uh, then the lines represent who helped whom with technology between time one and time two. So you can see this teacher here was providing a lot of help to her other grade two teachers. And um, this teacher here is providing some help to, to those in her cluster, in her community and outside, which is interesting. We can then understand the diffusion of innovations by tracking who changed their use of computers. These rings indicate a modest increase in use of technology in the classroom between time one and time two. And you can see the teacher two helped these two teachers and they in turn increased their implementation of the innovation. And here we can see teacher 20 learned from teacher two and was able to convey teacher two's knowledge to other teachers in her subgroup or her cluster. And they had big increases in their use of technology and teacher 20 also bridges down here and triggers several large increases in use of computers in the classroom uh, through her interactions with them. So the story of diffusion of innovation in the school uh, focuses on teacher 20, the bridging teacher. And then we could ask ourselves, can we study the same sort of thing with AI? Could we identify, if we had the pattern of interaction, could we identify the bridging teachers? Could we encourage them to play certain roles to acquire certain knowledge so that they can support the diffusion of innovations. So even given the potential of what I just showed you in survey, there's a lot we don't know. For example, we don't know the specific content of, a of teachers' interactions, how they make sense of their interactions, how their sense-making translates to behavior, how their interactions relate to the curriculum. We don't know if access to resources and influence on instruction is equitable. All we know really is we can track changes in teachers' behaviors and relate that to who they interact with in the network, but we don't know all these deeper things. And we think that actually AI could be helpful. So we have, um, how, how could AI help? Well, in analyzing the specific content of teachers' interactions, we could analyze transcripts and video data of interactions um, and AI 
she, you know, as, as, as should be very good for that. How do teachers make sense of their interactions? Like, how do they interpret that? I'm not quite sure how we would apply AI there. In terms of how teacher sense making translates to behavior, we could relate interactions to machine learning uh, applied to videos of instruction. And there's this project, the MET project, that has lots and lots of videos of teachers' instruction, and AI has been applied there and could be applied more. And then we could somehow relate teachers' interactions to their to, to, to videos of their classroom instruction. Um, and then we would know a little bit about their sense making. How do teachers' interactions relate to the curriculum? We really don't know. So I've got and, and how could AI help that? You all could help us figure that out. Some open questions. And now I turn it over to Caitlin Torfey, Kanaki. Okay, so going back to these questions here, um, I'm going to talk more about how we can use computational methods and artificial intelligence to address some of the questions that we cannot get at when we use traditional social science approaches. So back to the theoretical model that Ken uh, showed somewhat in the beginning of this presentation, we have this interaction between the curriculum and traditional professional development, which is typically face-to-face -face, and teachers practice, students engagement, and ultimately this production function of getting to student learning. And we can ask questions as researchers that we can use various methods to address. For example, we can observe what's happening within the classroom with the teacher. We can ask a teacher in an interview, for example, how are you planning your instruction? You know, tell me about what you do. Or we can give teachers surveys to understand more about what they're doing to plan their instruction in this particular case, or it could be a variety of questions we're seeking to answer. Um, similarly, as an AI, you could say, you know, an AI could try to get at these uh, questions, but the challenges of a human approach is, can we scale this? Can we scale humans going into teachers' classrooms and observing? Can we scale humans being able to have direct one-on-one -on -one interviews with other teachers? And how many is a reasonable scale? Um, how many participants do we need in a particular survey? And surveys often suffer from, for example, respondent bias. Additionally, we have to wonder when we approach this in these ways, is the question or observation tool we're using reliable? Are the people within our sample representative of the population we're trying to understand more about? Are the instruments we're using valid? Are the questions we're asking valid questions? And the responses we're receiving from our participants, in this case, teachers, are these authentic responses or are they responses that teachers are giving because they are being solicited um, by us being the interviewer? So another approach could be to use uh, computational methods with social media data to understand what teachers are doing in real time and how teachers are curating their instruction. So to answer the question regarding teachers planning, to understand more about that, using how teachers curate resources within social media might be a good tool to seek those answers. In this case, for example, you have a teacher who is self-directing, meaning not through the traditional hierarchy of um, curriculum diffusion through a school district or state of Department of Education, so they're self-directing their curation of instruction here. And they're doing that based both within, um, both, both on what they think is important, but also what they see their students' local needs are. And then this response that they have is ultimately going to impact their students because what teachers curate online ultimately will diffuse down into the classroom. Uh, so for example, a teacher may pin a particular resource. Here we have a math facts resource for early elementary. 
And then they may curate it within a particular teaching board that they have determined um, or organized within their own social media space. And this board will connect to a network of individuals within social media, which we have called in some of the papers I have socialized knowledge communities because they're um, promulgating human capital and social capital through their network ties, but also it's within a um, social media space online. So some of the advantages of using computational approaches to traditional uh, education research questions or social science questions is we can observe them at scale. They're uh, traditionally a little bit more authentic because they're being given by teachers aside from types of response bias. They happen in within real time and they're continuous. So continuously over time what we call longitudinal within social science. And uh, they satisfy the these of big data such as volume and velocity. We can observe them. We can observe teachers, how they curate, how they make sense of things by organizing them across different um, boards or social media spaces, how they network with professional colleagues. But we still find challenges such as, for example, the data is unstructured, it's not built for education research questions. So we have to find ways that are credible to be able to structure that data and to develop uh, causality without uh, violating rules of confounding principles, for example. So some things that we can do to address some of these issues are we can control, for example, um, and we can identify ways to control for various confounding variables by bringing in other sources of data and building what we call in the Teachers and Social Media Project rich data. So for example, we can bring in survey data that we do have of teachers. We can bring in interview data if we have interviewed particular teachers, observational data, and then also secondary administrative data such as the census data from the United States or particular state level census data. We can um, bring in school level administrative data that schools report regarding their students achievement. So some of these approaches will then give us a more holistic picture of how teachers are making sense. And how does this all relate to AI? So you can imagine all of the variety of ways you could leverage AI to address what's happening within teacher sense making, within teacher's behavior, um, how this is diffusing to students, and then how we can use machine learning techniques or other computational approaches to identify change. So speaking of change, things have changed significantly and it helps sometimes to look backwards in order to evaluate current day. So let's move backwards in time a little bit here and understand how educational influence has changed over time. Um, prior to social media and even prior to mass media, such as like TV or print news, there was a federal and state authority of knowledge. And these consisted of the principal estates, such as your government estates, and then also um, historically, it would even be the clergy or religious estates here. And the bucket of knowledge or the sphere of influence in which individuals could share knowledge or human capital was really within these estates without any public um, contribution. Around the 15th century, there was the entry of the Gutenberg Press and what became now mass media, and that was coined the fourth estate, in which now the sphere of influence and the public's ability to engage within uh, issues or current political issues of their day or social issues of their day really extended down to at least be able to read about it and understand more about what was going on within the world they lived. That was the fourth estate here. Since the onset of social media and web 2.0, we have experienced what people are now calling the fifth estate. 
And this fifth estate is an ability for social media to allow networks of individuals, embedded networks upon networks of people to come together and exert their influence for social change. Um, and these individuals by banding together within social media space are more empowered to directly challenge and influence how things are happening within the world and traditional conceptions of information diffusion. Within education, this means both challenging how uh, curriculum change happens or education policy and what education policies go through, et cetera. So the sphere of influence moves to encompass more and more individuals through time. So speaking about, okay, what is the specific content of teachers interactions and how can we use AI to identify these interactions? This is an example here of a teacher blogger. And here's a quote uh, from a future teacher, now a teacher today about where they seek out new information and advice. Without social media, teachers are really going to suffer because we don't have that many books. I'm not seeing that many books where someone's like, wow, look at these books with all these great lesson plans. They're saying, look at my blog, look at Pinterest, look at this online resource. So here in a very explicit way, we see a teacher or hear a teacher speaking about where they seek out um, education advice and we can conceptualize that as both the fifth estate and also something called teacherpreneurial behavior, which I'll get more into in a minute. So we wanted to know at the beginning of all of this, okay, are teachers actually using social media? And if so, how often and where are they going? So we went back to our traditional social science approaches and rather than just going on a social media space and saying, okay, I wanna capture all the tweets that say teacher. That doesn't actually tell us of a particular sample, the proportion of individuals that are using social media for teaching. So we went a more traditional approach and said, we're going to sample teachers and then ask them, um, how often are you using social media? And so what we found is, that 90% of teachers within our sample were using Pinterest and 80% of the early career teachers in our sample were using it at least once a month with over half of them using it at least once a week. And this resonated with other researchers from RAND and also from the National Council of Secondary Mathematics, which found similar results for teachers engagement with social media. We conceptualized or theorized why would teachers be using social media um, using a social network approach. And so what we thought is that basically we could see the influence extending from the physical world to the virtual world and vice versa. And teachers may seek out advice from um, prior, they may seek out advice from people that they're working with, the teachers within their school, or maybe teachers that they went to their um, college with that they might know in their professional relations. However, with social media and the online space, teachers can now seek out advice from a variety of peers across um, a variety of spaces. And this may influence their behavior and exchange of information. So how do teachers make sense of their interactions? Well, they use particular spaces for particular purposes. In our survey, we found that the platform was mediating and shaping how teachers were engaging and making sense of their um, resources they were procuring there. So for example, within Pinterest, we found teachers were both acquiring and sharing resources predominantly. While in Twitter, for example, teachers were using that mostly to stay informed of educational issues. Getting back to um, the teachers who are curating and sharing and acquiring information within Pinterest, uh, we coined in a paper that I have in the American Journal of Education, this idea of teacherpreneurial behavior or teacherpreneurs. So a teacherpreneur is someone who takes the initiative to find, share, and sell their materials or ideas related to their practice. Um, and these teachers are doing that despite risks inherent 
with wasted time or effort or the potential quality of these resources. And here's an example of a teacherpreneur here who has a very popular blog, stepintosecondgrade.com. See that there is the fifth estate and the networks of influence uh, within the fifth estate and how embedded networks of individuals come together within the fifth estate to exert their influence within education. And some of the emerging themes we found for this engagement include teachers' autonomy, their creativity and flexibility, the credibility they place within the resources that they're choosing, their ability to modify resources, and uh, finally, teacher-to-teacher -teacher trust. So this idea that this teacher is doing the same job that I'm doing and they understand best the types of challenges that I'm facing. So we can imagine AI coming to bear in many of these spaces in various ways. One way could be regarding credibility. How do teachers define and identify credible content? You could use AI, for example, to go through the types of resources and the associated text that teachers are sharing related to those resources and find patterns in the values that come forward regarding why they're choosing to curate these. Another example would be how resources are modified. You could actually use AI to identify changes in a particular resource, be it a text resource, or um, even more challenging in computation would be identifying changes within an image resource and looking at how the image resource changes relate to the new pinners that are um, pinning, or it could be, for example, in Instagram or in YouTube, uh, but posting new content. You could use AI to understand more about creativity and flexibility. For example, uh, Dr. Min Soon has done work related to school improvement plans and she used an AI approach to identify features that were important to school improvement plans, which were required for um, schools not meeting adequate progress according to state and national federal criteria. And then she identified these forthcoming features that schools associated with um, across school improvement plans and found what features best uh, related to schools later success. So that's again, using both AI, but also taking this rich data approach where you combine multiple sources of data to get to a research question. You could use AI to address student learning, which uh, um, Dr. Frank has already spoken about earlier in this talk, and there's a lot of great work happening at this particular conference related to. And finally, you could use AI to examine more closely teacher-to-teachers -teacher's interactions on social media, uh, looking into teacher-teacher -teacher trust or the other types of interactions they're having both within Pinterest, but uh, Twitter, Instagram, and seeing potentially how the various platform frames these interactions. So these are just a few ideas. Uh, we would love to hear more from you about some ideas that you have or other ongoing work. And from there, I'm going to uh, skip these and give it back to Ken. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, just highlight kind of how we're thinking about this, uh, stepping back. We have our argument here is that there is a teacher network that is behind or that the teacher is embedded in. And there's a student network that the students are embedded in. And these networks affect the way teachers teach and the way students learn. And so we really want to push the AI community to help us understand what's going on in those two networks. Because those two networks affect what happens in the classroom. The classroom, in a sense, is in the middle of those. Uh, and so if you advance the slide, um, so we say, we'll meet you in the middle. Uh, and 
That's Caitlin, actually. She's been the teacher that we've focused on in our uh, pictures uh, throughout. She, uh, she was a classroom instructor. So that's her in the middle. And she certainly is aware of how she was embedded in this teacher network. And that's me. Uh, so that's where we want to meet you. Meet us in the middle. Uh, help us study how the classroom, the learning experience is embedded in these broader networks. Thank you very much.